Vermont's Lower Carbon Future. My name is Peggy O'Neill Vivanco. I am the Vermont Clean Cities Coordinator. We are, um, we're gonna be recording this webinar so that uh, we can share it with folks later. Right now, participants are in a listen-only mode, so your cameras are off and you're muted. However, we'll go ahead and uh, unmute you for the breakout sessions and uh, the Q&A. Uh, so I'm hosting this with um, Alex DePillis from um, Vermont Ag and Jessica Poulin, Vermont Clean Cities intern. Uh, so just um, just a quick note on um, clean cities. Uh, we're Department of Energy funded. I'm housed at the Transportation Research Center, and I work with all fuels um, that are not petroleum, fully petroleum based. Um, and so we're going to go through the agenda real quickly. Just give you a quick overview of the agenda. We have a bunch of speakers um, who are going to talk about different aspects of pathways to um, decarbonization um, and then look at um, question and answer for all panelists. So hold your questions. You can certainly um, insert them in the chat or as I said, during the Q&A, we will um, allow folks to turn on their cameras and mics and go ahead and raise their hands. Then we're gonna get to work. We're gonna go into some breakout rooms uh, so that we have an opportunity to kind of think through um, issues like jobs and workforce, the cost of greenhouse gas emissions saved and implementation timeline, regionalization for any of these um, policies, and as well as resilience in looking at um, um, at modifying our, the fuels that we have now into uh, cleaner fuels. Uh, so quickly back to Queen Cities, we offer technical assistance and Tiger teams. We have the Department of Energy behind us. Um, it really is a national effort to reduce petroleum consumption in fleets and also to increase the nation's um, energy security. For Vermont, um, we like I said, we have coalition strategies that deal with everything from idle reduction to promoting biofuels to reducing vehicle miles traveled. And just to give you a, a quick snapshot, these are our 2020 um, greenhouse gas emissions reduced. So we have um, close to 70 stakeholders um, that are fleets and municipalities. And we ask for information once a year. Uh, from them to put together this information that goes through Department of Energy. And um, so with uh, over 14,000 tons of GHG reduced in 2020, which is actually an increase um, from 2019, and that is even all during COVID. Um, you see that we have like fuel economy improvements are like at the greatest chunk of what we can do, certainly in um, the heavy duty sector. Um, but we also have alternative fuels like biodiesel, we have hybrid electric, the VMT reductions, um, this uh, uh, the light green section there, more than doubled. I'm sure you can realize that was from folks um, telecommuting as opposed to going to driving to work during the pandemic. And this tiny little sliver of off-road vehicles, that's tripled in one year. I know it's a small percentage, but even looking at what are the menu of options that we can offer our fleets and getting those off-road vehicles into cleaner fuels is an easy way. So before we kind of get into these presentations, um, I'm taking off my transportation hat and I'm putting on my cultural anthropologist hat because we need to look beyond the numbers. We need to look at ways to bring all Vermonters along this pathway. Um, we all want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We are certainly keenly aware of the consequences of not doing so. Uh, but we also need to think about how to address the necessary cultural and behavioral changes that are, that are, that are going to help us move the needle and help us think about how we stop driving as much, how we shift our work days, um, and how we move more people around in fewer vehicles. Uh, this is Vermont. We need to support our working landscapes. Uh, what does that mean? What are all those things that make Vermont special? We need to invest in workforce development for this shift to different fuels and technologies. 
um, and especially work with communities that are impacted by these energy transitions, as well as underserved groups. Uh, and then for the policies that support all this, it's compact land use, it's increasing transit, it's investment in biofuels, and then there are others that my colleagues will, will be addressing. So um, just invite you all to kind of keep an open mind as we look not only for these policies, but move beyond the numbers into the human scale of how we do this, bringing all our Vermonters along the path with us. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce Alex Stapilis, my co-presenter. Alex is the Energy and Climate Specialist at the Agency of Ag, and he is helping to draft the Comprehensive Energy Plan and is staffing one of the subcommittees of the Climate Council. Um, he has experience developing clean energy policies and projects in the private sector, and he helps farmers with farm integrated energy policies especially manure digesters, um, and is a state partner to the EPA's AgStar, which promotes biogas recovery system to reduce methane. Alex, you want to take it over? Okay, seven minutes. You guys are going to get the super duper policy context here, and it's a big one. This is very important timing, and um, uh, let's see, take control. I'm going to start presenting here. Um, Thank you everybody for being here. I'm really excited. Thank you, Clean Cities and everybody that's stepped up to present and listen in, so on and so forth. So we are here to set the stage, um, no less. It's up to you. I'm really gonna put, push people here in this meeting today to be ready to talk about what makes sense. Um, we're really the first out of the gate on this in terms of this policy discussion. I said debate, it's a discussion. There will be a debate, there always is. We're going to give you the lay of the land. And you know the spoiler alert here is that we've got our work cut out for us. We're going to talk technology, policies, other implementations already in the North America. Um, you know, policy trade-offs must be identified. We're not going to say in these climate action plans and comprehensive energy plans that we're going to do everything. That would mean doing nothing. So, you know, stay tuned here for the breakout sessions where you're going to weigh in. The Here's the two big policy things that are happening that bring us together today. The Comprehensive Energy Plan and the Climate Action Plan. So the Comprehensive Energy Plan comes every six years. It's got these specific goals of 90% renewable by 2050 and in a way that also meets the state's climate goals. Climate Action Plan, totally new, uh, not totally, but Act 153 of 2020, Global Warming Solutions Act, has its own goals and the climate action plan has to be uh, created by the climate council subsequent rules have to be made by the agency of natural resources and there's a little nugget at the bottom there um, that's kind of interesting you don't see that in law statute very much that uh, anybody can sue them if they don't do it in an adequate way so this is real stuff um you know sort of like um no more messing around and here's uh, the, what we are up against. Here's our renewable goals. And guess what? Business as usual is not going to get us there. Um, here is the climate goals. And, you know, who knows, right? It's also kind of an exponential curve. Um, it goes down pretty quickly to begin with. But again, as I said, got our work cut out for us. Here are the overlap between the climate and energy plan. Those first two bullets in the overlap are really what we have to talk about today. How do you get uh, greenhouse gas cost of uh, emissions reductions cost effectively? What does that mean in terms of pathways on energy and other things? So those are the two things that we really are going to at least start diving into. Here's the timelines. It's all happening pretty quick. Uh, both of these things basically are due at the end of the year. Here's the comprehensive energy plan due as these things always are to the legislature in January. Uh, that is going to at least be the draft. Um, there may be an update to it, but here's the and here's the Global Warming Solutions Act Climate Action Plan due again at the end of the year. So um, pressure's on. So uh, today we're going to talk about decarbonizing the heating and transportation. So you know we've talked a lot about electrification in Vermont. We're on that path. How close will it get us? What you know to our energy and climate goals, and what are some of the relative costs? And therefore. Also, you know, what are the policies and what costs do they carry? Let's look at electric vehicles. You know, there's a lot of talk about electric vehicles sort of like on the tip of everybody's tongue. Here's the article from my local uh, paper. What is it? Uh, 
some number of thousands of words talking about EVs and charging, um, you know, look, basically saying a commitment to a societal evolution that needs to happen. Well, how quickly could it happen? Let's just take that. Here's the adoption rate of registered electric vehicles in Vermont. So I have actual data from uh, 2014 to 2018. There's an annual increase during that time of about 38% a year. Um, so you would need six more years to get to 10% uh, electric vehicles in the vehicle mix in Vermont, roughly. Um, and then you, you know, in 10, 10 years from now, maybe you get to that 40% that number up there. So, you know, there's an adoption rate for these things. They take time. Um, Let's see, this is a slide doesn't seem to have come through. The annual um, cost of some of the pathways, is that, I guess that's not visible. So uh, basically what you see is the cost per ton of greenhouse gas emissions varies a lot depending on what you do. These electric vehicle pathways are some, something like, you know, negative 10 or 20 bucks or maybe 15, 10 dollars a ton, positive uh, above zero dollars per ton. You look at some of the other things that we're doing to achieve uh, greenhouse gas reductions, and they're up there in the $100 per ton, or you take electric school buses and that's you know $9,000 a ton. Now, of course, there's other reasons to do things, but we do have to bear cost, keep cost in mind as we start making these policy uh, recommendations. Here's what the Comprehensive Energy Plan said last time uh, about how we could get to the greenhouse gas goals and the energy goals. Um, and what you see here is that uh, the total amount of energy used goes down. Electricity kind of stays the same. The blue box there is roughly the same. Uh, and, uh, and actually biofuels increases in this scenario of how to hit the goals. So that was what we said last time. And we still need to see from the Department of Public Service what uh, things, how things shaped up compared to this uh, scenario. So that's one scenario that was that was put forth, a, a illustrative path forward. Now, let's quick note on policies here. Um, federal policy is really, there's no big federal policy on meeting energy or climate goals. There is a renewable fuel standard through the EPA. It's a small requirement, you know, basically minimal effect, I would say. Um, we don't see a lot of biofuels or an increasing amount of biofuels in the fuel mix. This is a transportation fuel standard, by the way. There is from this uh, standard, very good science on life cycle carbon footprint of fuel production. Um, it's coarse in a way, but it's there. And you know, a lot of work has been done on that. Some standards, uh, the federal government's good at standards on performance of equipment, you know, miles per gallon, all that stuff. So you know, regional policies come into this too. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is a greenhouse gas cap and, and, trade, cap and trade policy on electricity electric utility emissions only. We've talked about a regional policy for transportation, uh, a cap and trade policy again, basically. And so far, uh, three states and the District of Columbia have signed on, and the others are, quote, actively participating in developing the Transportation and Climate Initiative program and might join in the future. So regionally, uh, nothing happening yet on transportation that Vermont is involved with. Our fuels policy has basically been to use electricity to displace fossil fuels. Um, we're good at regulating electricity um, and at electricity policy. It, it's one way that you know you increase the amount of electricity or keep it at least the same. And then there's been many other attempts in Vermont policy, um, you know, a cap and carbon tax and dividend idea, um, a regional low carbon fuel standard discussions back in 2012, but basically not much policy here on the fuel side in Vermont except electricity. So this is today's charge. You decide. There's a lot of ideas on policy. Our uh, staff went through some ideas here on just a fun exercise a few meetings ago. You know, and some of these ideas are pretty black and white, like just ban internal combustion engines. But you know what? Nobody gets to wave their wand. Nobody has a, you know, philosopher king uh, ability to just say how things should be. And policies, by the way, require supporters. You want to get things done? You need supporters. And that means you need compromises. And finally, remember, Policies have trade-offs. The Climate Action Plan has deep public engagement baked in. So there are going to be a lot of ideas about what to do in the Climate Action Plan. And the, the Comprehensive Energy Plan, likewise, this time, will dive deep into the trade-offs. Um, and that's where the breakout sessions come in. So we will capture takeaways 
and report out to all who registered. Um, I think, is that my last slide? Let's see. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, very much. And then I say. Um, so, Alex, you hand, yeah, you it. hand it over. Yep. Um, next up, we have um, Ryan Lambert. He's a clean energy strategic consultant. Uh, he's worked in clean energy projects in California and New York. And he's helping share the success stories of lowering carbon while increasing, increasing renewable content and energy demands with organizations across the US. And um, he's new to Vermont, so he re resides um, up in Stone. So go ahead, Ryan, you can start your presentation. Great, thanks, Peggy. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you're all set. So yeah, thanks, Alex, and thanks, Peggy, and thanks for all the other co-presenters and those who joined us today. Um, just a little background on myself. Uh, I spent the last 20 years working with uh, low carbon fuels in different ways. So helped build a biodiesel production facility, a 25 million gallon facility out at the uh, Port of Stockton in California, and also built an energy efficiency company um, with uh, energy raters up and down the state of California. So uh, moved from there into really doing uh, consulting with lots of different alternative fuels, everyone from NYSERDA and DOE programs um, to energy electric programs and certainly the National Biodiesel Board over the last decade. So um, I've given lots of these talks and unfortunately in, in each of these cases there's always some sort of huge event uh, to speak to. So uh, only just to make it very much present for our, you know, looking out any window, we see the smoke from Oregon uh, here in Vermont. And uh, we know that 13 states along the West are in dire consequence right now and, and dealing with huge amounts of fires and smoke. So it, it only emphasizes the importance of now and why we need to make real carbon reductions uh, part of our energy planning and strategy and implement those, those, those goals as quickly as possible. So luckily, uh, Alex has already talked about what those uh, codified goals are here in the state of Vermont. But just to reemphasize that, you know, 25% of our remaining energy needs to come from renewable resources by 2025. That's only four years away, 40% uh, by 2035. And, and I'm really not focusing too much on what's going to happen in 30 years. I'm more interested in what we can do today um, and in the next 10 years. So, um, you know, th this quote here, there is no one silver bullet to fight climate change and transition to a low carbon economy, but we do have silver buckshot, many proven and available solutions that can cut pollution, save money and strengthen our economy. So again, uh, the, the organization uh, Environmental Action Network, uh, which uh, Alex took a bunch of pictures of, I too uh, love their report. And I just wanna reemphasize that our common enemy here is fossil fuels. We need to work collectively across all energy types to reduce fuel and push back on the fossil fuel generally monopoly. What is that monopoly? Well, across the whole US, we're talking about most of our energy coming from natural gas and petroleum, so nuclear and coal. Uh, renewable energy has grown just by another percentage point from 2019 to 2020, from 11 to 12 percent. And as you can see, of that 12%, about 40% of that is bio-based energy from bio-waste, biofuels, and wood. Um, there's more biofuel energy out there than solar energy today. Now, all, the only point is that we need to work collectively across all these renewable fuel types, again, to push back against that petroleum uh, interests and, and what's dominating our fuel source. So again, thank you for, for EAN to, to looking at their, their annual progress report. I borrowed this uh, as their total source energy, but I added a few uh, bits of flavor uh, about potential ways we can go. So today we could do B20 in transportation and push back on that, on that diesel pool. We could also look towards 2030, just like California, Oregon, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, excuse me, Illinois, other states are really embracing biofuels to push back against the, uh, their diesel um, monopoly there. Um, and on the gasoline, uh, there's also um, 
Some of these images aren't popping up, but the renewable natural gas, E15, um, and EVs, you know, as, as Alex pointed out, we only have about 4,000 electric vehicles in our state. That's 0.6%. Um, so 94, you know, 99.4% of our, our vehicle pool today is still ICE vehicles. Uh, so we need to do whatever we can to increase electric vehicles. And by 2035, perhaps we can get to that 10%, as, as Alex pointed out. And by 2050, uh, even really pushing back and really ramping up. But we could also, meantime, and more importantly, the timing of now to push back with um, uh, against the, the petroleum infrastructure uh, with other alternative fuels. On the thermal side, bioheat, I'll let Matt talk about this opportunity. Uh, we could be driving this much like other uh, regional states are uh, and um, even going beyond 20% to 50%. This is our dominant way that we heat homes here in the state of Vermont. Uh, we're not replacing tanks quickly enough. We can simply uh, replace that diesel fuel with a renewable fuel that's very, very low carbon. Um, we can push back with renewable natural gas. Again, Tom uh, from VGS will speak to that. And, and along the way, there's even opportunities with renewable propane and electric heat pumps, of course, um, accompanying, uh, working together to give us closer to this 90% reduction that we really need. And on the electric side, which is a smaller portion, but uh, solar, wind, as well as biogas, um, opportunities to give us green electrons on the grid. So that's one good visualization for it. Um, another way to think about it is uh, looking at our fuel pool today with Vermont Transportation, we're burning about 350 million gallons of petroleum. Uh, that top number here, 350, is is the gallons of petroleum, mostly in, in gasoline with a lot of diesel and 10% ethanol. Uh, electric with, with 4,000 electric vehicles is not pushing back on that fast enough. By 2025, if we could use 20% uh, biodiesel, for example, which we know we can do, uh, we could actually surpass our 10% goals um, by 2025. And by 2035, uh, we could really start to see great diversity, more resiliency, and, and more fuel types um, pushing back on the petroleum infrastructure. We won't get to that 40% reduction with electric alone. We we'll really need to embrace other alternative fuels and those that are available today. Um, same with the vehicles. So this is just kind of rethinking it, but now looking at it from the vehicle population. Um, as you can see, we have about 550, nearly 600,000 uh, vehicles on our roads here in the state of Vermont um, with about 4,000 electric vehicles and about 30,000 diesel. So that's what's dominating. But by 2025, we can increase that electric vehicle population as well as by 2035, we could transition some of that diesel fuel, most of that diesel fuel over to renewable fuel while diversifying on our light duty sector. Um, as Alex talked about, there's a lot of carbon reductions. This came from our CEP, uh, the Comprehensive Energy Plan. And if you notice many of the opportunities um, that, were val uh, that were studied back in 2016 are really kind of electric. There's some weatherization and some pellet stoves here, but I, I would like to suggest that as we roll out the 2021, um, 2022 comprehensive energy plan, we're starting to integrate more of these biofuel opportunities. Uh, could be B5, B20, RNG, renewable propanes, RNG for school buses, et cetera. Timing is key. These are really going to uh, be important because we can use this in current infrastructure and current vehicles today. Um, I did want to reemphasize, and I know Tom will talk about this, but uh, you can't read it, but these are the 15 biodigesters throughout the state of Vermont. As we know, we don't have um, any refineries, so any return to alternative fuels that we create in the state are really uh, pushing back on and, and, and increasing jobs and equity here in the state. We only have 15, and that's probably maybe 10 or 15% of the total potential. And if we used all of those creamery residuals, animal processing residuals, commercial food waste, we could potentially, if we could collect it all and, and turn it into 
diesel gil gallon equivalents, it could be approximately 100 million to 200 million gallon equivalents. I'm not saying we could collect it all feasibly or affordably, but we certainly could do better. And, and all of that means equity for our rural economy. Um, I know that, that Colin's going to talk a lot about the low carbon fuel standard. I just wanted to reemphasize that that program out in California, electric vehicles have gone from 1% to about 20% of the credit generation. But in the last 10 years of implementation, 85% of the total credits are bio-based. That's RNG, biodiesel, R, um, renewable hydro-treated diesel, and ethanol. Um, so all of these are working together. And we now have 10 years of data that allows for a deep dive on co-benefits, pollution reduction, and the economic boom that it creates. I have a visual for that, which is the California, it's, it's fuels, as I talked about in, in Vermont, we're burning 350 million. Here it's almost 20 billion gallons of, of petroleum fuel. As you can see, um, over 10 years, uh, we're still uh, you know, at a place in California that, that has made a significant change, but that the petroleum monopoly is still huge. So we have to work together. Also looking at the biomass-based diesel number, that's nearly a billion gallons. That's five times as much uh, diesel as we're burning in the state of Vermont. So we could have policies that really drive renewable fuels as well as great amount of electricity. As you can see, the equivalent gallons would be about 115 million um, equivalent gallons of electricity. That would do about half of our electric needs in, um, in the state of Vermont. So what are the major biofuel takeaways? Um, you know, Alex mentioned that there's kind of a coarse understanding. Um, I would say that actually many of the life cycle and indirect land use issues have already been largely resolved. And you don't have to believe me, you can believe CARB um, and the modeling that they've done around those. Uh, biofuels are 100% EV compatible. For example, you know, when it comes to energy density, we don't have a solution for those uh, seven and eight, you know, um, large vehicles, uh, large diesels, and yet uh, oils and fats are at least 15 times more energy dense than our best batteries. So green hydrogen is another way of storing energy and using it to power vehicles. Um, the immediacy, I've talked a lot about that, but I think it, it's important to emphasize that the cumulative impacts of carbon and methane in terms of reducing those are massive. Um, um, and if we're doing those year after year after year, that's how our globe works. Uh, we need to reduce those now, and they really pr provide kind of a discount rate uh, in, in net present value. Um, of course, real jobs at lower cost than other alternatives because of that same infrastructure and same vehicle stock, um, that is equity. And finally, um, resiliency and risk mitigation. We need to stick on track. We need to choose all of the above. Um, uh, also, that our news feeds are filled with the fact that batteries and EVs are, are improving every day. Elon Musk fills our, our news feeds, but so is the bioeconomy. We have ways of turning garbage and waste into uh, more efficient fuels every day. It's not just transitional. Biofuels transform permanent agricultural supplies into higher use products. So as long as we have humans and animals on the planet, we're gonna need food and we're gonna need feed and we're gonna need energy. So capturing these inefficiencies and that's in those systems um, are uh, using biofuels can be a fantastic way to uh, push back on that petroleum infrastructure today. Um, and even if you consider them transitional, Biofuels can also be bioplastics, bioproducts in the future. Um, so developing that market's really important. So it's not either or, it's both and more. And I'll end there. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. All right, everybody, keep fastening your seatbelts. We have just a lot of information coming at you. Uh, so try to just stop sharing. Stop. Yeah. Here we go.
Here we go. Uh, next up, we have Colin Murphy. Colin is the Deputy Director of the Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy at UC Davis. Uh, he guides research and outreach on issues relating to transportation, energy, air quality, and carbon markets. Prior to joining the Policy Institute, he was a Science Policy Fellow at uh, the California, California Council on Science and Te Technology. Um, he was an advocate for sustainable transportation and energy policy with the Next Gen Policy Center, where he helped extend California's climate programs through 2030. So Colin, go ahead and we will have Jessica forward your slides for you, okay? Great, uh, thanks for, for inviting me here. Happy to, to talk to you about this really important topic. Um, try advancing one more. I think the, the graphic didn't show up there. There we go. Um, so uh, <clears throat> like Peggy said, I've, I've been working on low carbon fuels and sustainable transportation policy for a number of years. Um, UC Davis has a long connection to sustainability. Uh, we're located right next to Sacramento. So we work very closely with the California Air Resources Board. Uh, the director of our institute at UC Davis actually sits on, on uh, the, the sort of main decision-making body of the Air Resources Board. And he's one of the two co-creators uh, of the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which is a policy topic that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today, um, but really talking about how it fits into a broad portfolio of technology. And I think the, the most important uh, message to, to get out there, and this really echoes some of the things that, that Ryan and others have said, is that there's no single fuel or technology that can do it alone. In this case, uh, we're talking about reducing the emissions from transportation down to a sustainable level. In California, um, we just finished uh, a report for the state where we looked at how California can get its entire transportation sector to carbon neutrality by 2045. Uh, I led the, the fuels analysis on that. And we ran a whole bunch of scenarios. We have one of the, the best uh, electric vehicle research centers in, in the country, I think in, in the world, um, working on this, who uh, we tried to see if we could, by throwing as much policy at EVs by themselves, uh, could, could get to neutrality by 2045 with just electric vehicles. And even though EVs are probably the single most important technology are going to do the majority of the emissions reduction work between now and then. No matter how hard we pushed, we couldn't get there with a, a purely all electric portfolio. So there's a number of roles, a number of things you need. Um, alternative liquid fuels, which practically in the near future means biofuels, where you're going to need that. Um, it's to reduce emissions from the existing fleet of vehicles to sort of buy ourselves time for the transition to EVs to, to continue. And then in the long run, there's certain applications, things like aviation, some kinds of heavy duty trucking, uh, that just really the, we're not sure if batteries and the electric drivetrain is gonna be a good long-term fit uh, to solve those needs. So there's gonna be a need for liquid fuels and that's where biofuels fit in. That's where a policy like the LCFS really helps provide a balance between supporting the fuels that uh, can be scaled up rapidly and can, can deliver a lot of, of emissions reductions in the short term while providing very strong support and setting a clear long-term signal, we're gonna need the stuff that can actually uh, approach or even achieve actual carbon neutrality. So what we saw from, from this modeling exercise, which involved uh, four different University of California um, Institutes of Transportation Studies, about uh, 35 total authors, uh, was that it is gonna take an all hands on deck approach, but uh, there are certainly uh, multiple ways you can achieve this successful portfolio uh, over the long term. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, really I wanna talk about why you need to, to think about fuels uh, and have a specific policy on that. Um, uh, as, as previous speakers mentioned, there's the, the federal fuels policy, which has brought some biofuels into the mix, but uh, has really not had a particularly significant role on re reducing emissions. Um, you know, you, you're going to have EV policy, you're going to have policies to electrify the grid. Uh, obviously, you want to do things like support public transportation and provide uh, other options to, to vehicle travel. Uh, there's, there's a lot of considerations, including equity, environmental justice, and job creation have to be balanced. And all these things can be balanced through, through good policy. But in order to do this, you need to have something that specifically targets vehicle fuels if you want to get your transportation down to zero. Um, and, and there's a few reasons for that. The first is that near-term emissions uh, matter. It's not just that hitting uh, targets, like in California, we have a target to reduce emissions 40% by 2030. Um, that's not just sort of a, a milestone on the long-term path, but 
uh, reducing emissions quickly matters. Uh, reducing a ton of emissions today does more to help prevent climate climate change than reducing a ton of emissions five years from now. So you you do need to adopt some of the technologies that can reduce emissions uh, quickly, even if they can't necessarily uh, achieve the long term carbon neutrality target. Um, like I said, EVs are going to be the main uh, technology in the long term future, but uh, the fleet turns over slowly. The, the cars people are buying today, uh, which are still almost in, entirely internal combustion, many of them are still going to be on the road in 2050. We have to have fuels that that can uh, supply them and let people drive using them um, that don't completely blow us by our emissions targets. Um, at least in, in the near term, looks like biofuels are probably the only way you're going to get significant uh, scales of, of alternative fuels. Uh, there's some technologies that, that don't require biomass that, that may someday come online. Um, and, uh, but at least for, for the short term, probably supporting these biofuels and making sure they're done well, um, is, is very important. And like I said, over the long run, there's going to be some long-term needs for liquid fuels. Um, and really critically, uh, you do need to do a lot of science and have a careful life cycle analysis in order to make sure the biofuels are as good as, as advertised. And you can do biofuels wrong. And this is one of the challenges. If you looked at the Europe's first attempt to, uh, add a lot more biofuels to their portfolio. Uh, the policy was was not sufficiently thought out, wasn't designed well, and it supported a lot of uh, palm oil-based uh, renewable diesel coming in. And that contributed a lot to deforestation um, in tropical forests to grow more palm oil. Um, in, in that case, the, the policy did not achieve it, its emissions goals. It, uh, and we wanna make sure that uh, we learn from the mistakes of, of the past and, and do things better. And so there, the, the science, as Ryan pointed out, uh, on life cycle analysis has been developed quite a bit, um, thanks to both federal and, and state actions. We need to really make sure that fuels policies are, are science-based um, and the LCFS does that, does that uh, as, as well, if not better than any policy uh, out there in the field. And the last thing, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you need to, to sort of find a way to balance the benefits of things that are available now and can scale up really quickly, um, even if they can't necessarily get to zero, against the, the need to supply a lot of help to the fuels that can actually get us to zero. And I think that the structure of a low-carbon fuel standard does that. Um, I know Eileen's going to talk to you a little bit more about that as she moves forward. Next slide, please. Oh, I go, go backward. There we go. Um, the the basic way uh, is you set this target. That's that's the the that dotted line on, on the graph. Uh, any fuel that is emits more carbon for every unit of energy than the target uh, it has to pay into the system, and that money goes to support fuels that are less carbon intensive. And so what that means is that um, at right now, and and for the first you know usually at least five to ten years of any low carbon fuel standard program, the only fuels that are more carbon intensive than your target are petroleum. Uh, so what this means is that an LCFS creates a system in which the, the polluter pays, the, the high carbon intensity fuels, the petroleum fuels, end up subsidizing the low carbon alternatives um, in order to go and, and create this, this long-term trajectory to a uh, sustainable transportation system. Next slide, please. And what we've seen is uh, low carbon fuel standards are, are active, not just in California, but Oregon adopted a low carbon fuel standard in 2016. British Columbia, um, the Canadian province, adopted a low carbon fuel standard at the same time as California back in 2011. And uh, our department is, is just putting the finishing touches on a review of all three, three of these LCFS programs where there's a lot of data where you can do uh, you know, sort of a comparison between them. And what we're seeing is the program is functioning basically as intended in all three jurisdictions. You're seeing more low carbon fuels enter the system. Uh, you're seeing lower carbon alternatives. Uh, and you're seeing a mix of, of both uh, you know, readily scalable near-term fuels as well as electricity and some very low carbon fuels that, that might have longer term value. So the history behind LCFS and, and the science behind it has been demonstrated uh, not, not just through modeling and, and theoretical analysis, but now in practice in, in three jurisdictions, uh, Washington state is, is on track to become the fourth, uh, having just passed a bill to allow it. Next slide. Um, the other thing that I think really speaks uh, well about the LCFS is the fact that it, it distributes the, the benefits to a really wide variety of stakeholders. If you think about the transportation fuel system, especially a, a sustainable fuel system that's capable of meeting our long-term targets, it encompasses 
electricity, renew renewable natural gas, biofuel producers from a variety of different feedstocks, a variety of different fuel distributors and, and retailers. And when you look at the history in California, we're seeing that distribution of, of uh, benefits uh, across the state. We've got a number of biofuel production facilities that have uh, risen in state as well as several uh, in, in the immediate vicinity. Um, there's at least 14 businesses in California that are, that are receiving at least $6 million uh, annually in, in LCFS credits. Um, almost every utility in California receives LCFS credits for uh, the, the charging of electric vehicles that, that people do at home. Now, uh, EV charging credits have to be spent in ways that, that promote the long-term um, expansion of the EV market, uh, but a number of utilities are realizing that in a world of energy efficiency where the amount of electricity they're likely to sell is, is going to go down, EVs help ensure that they can continue to make the investments in, in uh, grid maintenance and, and infrastructure over the long term. We've seen a number of commercial fleets, including a lot of warehouses uh, in, in using their uh, forklift and cargo handling fleets have switched to electricity and are receiving um, LCFS credits. There have been uh, thousands of EV charging stations, hundreds of natural gas charging stations. We've got about 75 hydrogen vehicle fueling stations, all of whom uh, are all of whom are uh, receiving value from the LCFS. Um, we're getting you know, multiple billions of dollars of, of credit value uh, per year now. Um, uh, you know, quite a bit over the the history of the program. And to date, uh, actually, this this number is is about a year old. Uh, over 50 million tons of greenhouse gases uh, have been avoided going in the atmosphere because of the action of the LCFS. Next slide. So um, in this slide deck, uh, which I think is going to be circulated, I had a few slides that include a lot of resources. Um, this is an incredibly complex topic. Uh, we are, we're happy to, to keep engaging with you and providing uh, some insight. But uh, if you go forward to the next to the slides, got my, my email address on it. But there's two more slides that have links to a wide variety of, of oh, I guess only one slide in this one. Um, okay, so there's a slide with, with a lot of, of key uh, uh, resources that you can uh, look at and, and think about. And at the Policy Institute, you know, our job is to really help interface between the research community and the public policy community. This includes legislators, regulators, but also businesses, community groups, everybody who is in, has a stake in the long-term future of sustainable climate. Um, so we're, we're happy to go and, and help uh, walk you through this. We have a number of, of briefings and materials to, to get people up to speed on, on these topics. And that's really part of our core mission. So uh, please feel free to, to reach out. Um, we can set up times to, to discuss and um, that's it. Happy to take questions uh, when the discussion starts. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. All right. Um, so our next presenter is Eileen Tutt. Eileen has served at the California Electric Transportation Coalition Director for over 10 years. She was recently selected as Executive Director of the Electric Transportation Community Development Corporation, uh, an organization dedicated to working with communities to ensure that environmental and jobs benefits are realized in all communities, particularly those most impacted by air pollution and economic disparity. Eileen has worked in uh, California state government for over 15 years, served as Dep deputy secretary for the California EPA and in various positions at uh, the California Air Resources Board. Okay, Eileen, uh, you're ready to go ahead and take control of your wish. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, first of all, for inviting me to speak today. And I do wanna just acknowledge the work that Colin presented from the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. He mentioned that we have two of the dads of the low carbon fuel standard that are both uh, academia. And one of them is of course, Dan, uh, Colin's boss, Dan Sperling, Dr. Dan Sperling. And another is Dr. Alex Farrell, who was at UC Berkeley at the time. He has since passed away, but I do wanna just recognize that this, this policy in California, the low carbon fuel standard, the clean fuel standard adopted by Oregon and Washington, they're all based on strong academic and research around what we need to do in order to decarbonize the fuel sector. And I think Colin's presentation was excellent in that it just pointed out that we, we do need a whole portfolio of fuels. I, I wanna just say, you know, in full honesty that 
Um, I have spent my entire 30 year career trying to figure out how to diversify the transportation fuels sector, because I do believe that this portfolio approach is a lot better for our, mostly for our economy, um, but also for our environment than um, depending on a single fuel in the transportation fuel sector. And, and as we know, transportation is the foundation and mobility is the foundation of our economy. So we need to have a more diverse transportation fuels future. And it, as we move towards this decarbonization effort and reducing climate change emissions, there needs, there's very clear, at least in California, that we needed a fuel policy that encouraged this diversity. And, and Colin, I think, represented well what it did. Um, I, I, I was part of the administration, the Schwarzenegger administration, when uh, this policy was put into an executive order and then adopted by the California Air Resources Board. I worked at both the California Air Resources Board and the California EPA. Um, and so I have a long history with this particular policy, and I do agree with Colin, it's probably, if not for certain, one of the few fuel policies that really has been successful in decarbonizing transportation fuels. I do want to say that this policy, um, and Colin kind of showed this slide, but this policy was adopted by an executive order, so administratively, but then the legislature stepped in and, and did their job, as they do, <laughs> and they adopted uh, the LCFS as part of our broader climate policy. So this slide gives you an idea of our very ambitious targets in California. So we had originally, when it was adopted back in the early 2000s, um, we had set our target at 10% reduction by 2020. There were a number of lawsuits. I'm just going to suggest that this is something that uh, perhaps Vermont can lean on California to help with. We did prevail as a state in all of the lawsuits and the LCFS was allowed to continue forward, but it did take a lot of work on the part of um, stakeholders like the California Electric Transportation Coalition, our members, and the state of California. So once we prevailed, we not only prevailed in continuing to move toward the 10% goal by 2020, but actually increasing the carbon reduction goal to reduce the carbon content of fuel by 20% by 2030. Um, I, I do want to say uh, the thing that that's kind of uh, surprising to those of us who were there in the initial years was everybody thought that sort of cellulosic ethanol and biofuels were going to be the predominant fuel uh, in the future to reduce the carbon content. And I think it is uh, an example of the success of this kind of fuel neutral carbon reduction policy that what happened was very different. We had a much more diverse portfolio of, of fuels that included biofuels, as Ryan mentioned, and included electricity and hydrogen and renewable diesel. And so I just want to say for my first bullet here, the importance of the indirect land use calculation and an energy efficiency uh, ratio. And the reason we have indirect land use and the reason that is so important is that we learn from what happened in Europe and that we don't want to just export our carbon emissions to areas of the world where things like, you know, palm oil and burning our forests are happening. And so the indirect land use calculations are very important and it was a lot of work to get there. But other states, including Washington, Oregon, have built their programs and incorporated the work that was done by our academic researchers, largely at, at I said, UC Davis and, and UC Berkeley, um, to establish these indirect land use calculations. And, they, and they've come under attack over the years but at the end, I think it's very clear that they're absolutely vital because our program, and again, in Oregon and Washington as well, has not resulted in uh, deforestation or other um, negative consequences that we've seen from other fuel policies. I also just want to say that from an electric vehicle perspective, and this is not just an electric vehicle, it's also hydrogen, renewable natural gas, there are vehicle types that are not internal combustion engines that are just more efficient. And in order to recognize the full benefit of something like an electric battery electric car or any of the other 
fuels that I mentioned, there has to be an energy efficiency ratio to recognize that the fuel, once it goes into the vehicle, is just more, more efficiently used than in an internal combustion engine vehicle. So both the indirect land use factors and the energy efficiency ratios are important, but fortunately they are complicated, but they have been worked out. And, and just to give you an idea of what happens when you put a price on, on the carbon content of fuel, and, and you really leave it fuel neutral, and this is just for electric cars, I will say that um, obviously the other fuels also generate uh, credits. But on the West Coast, for example, a Class 8 electric truck, and, and I would say this is the same for, um, for a transit bus, which is more likely to be electrified, so to speak, uh, the value of the LCFS credits is $150,000 over the lifetime. Or if you look at the electricity value, it's 22 cents per kilowatt hour, which is kind of wonky, but for, in my world, that's pretty important. And same with light duty EV, light duty electric vehicles, the utilities are generating about $7,000 in credits for those vehicles. And, and the regulation itself says who can generate those credits. So unlike other fuels, electricity is just physically, and by that I mean from a physics perspective, very different than most other fuels. Um, and the way electricity is regulated is also very different. Uh, other fuels don't typically have economic regulators like public utility commissions, or if they're a public utility, they have their local boards and they are, every dollar they spent is, is dictated to, and, how, and how they spend is very transparent. So what um, the Air Resources Board in California did was they said for non-residential, so those that electricity fuel being used out of the home, the owner of the charging station, and they're the ones who make the investment, right, in putting, say, if you're a target, you put a charging station in your, in your parking lot, that's an investment. So they can generate the LCFS credits and incremental credits, which uh, again, the LCFS has been adopted over time, I think, to in improve it incremental credits, which are additional credits that electricity gets if you use renewable fuels or you uh, encourage charging at times when we have right now in California, because we have such a strong renewable fuel standard, a renewable electricity standard, there are times in our day uh, when, <laughs> when we're actually curtailing or not using the renewable fuel generated. So if you can capture that electricity rather than it being wasted, that renewable electricity, you can generate additional credits for that electricity fuel. And that is actually true for all fuels. If you are a biofuel that is um, more renewable, you get more credits. And so it's not, it's not specific to electricity, it's just something to note that when you have these incremental credits, others can generate them, including um, automakers. Um, now, the base residential credits, which is where most people charge their cars, do go to the utilities and those credits are sold and they, they generate revenue and the state tells them or their utility boards, whether they're publicly elected boards, tell them how they are going to, um, how they're going to invest that money. And so um, I, I just want to give a shout out to something Ryan mentioned, because I think it's really important in that there is there's also opportunities which we haven't really fully recognized yet, but I do think as we get into electrifying the larger vehicles and equipment, um, this idea of a, a, a plug-in hybrid that uses a renewable or a near renewable or a clean biofuel is, is a very attractive option. Um, and so I, I think that, that, we, that we just want to kind of think about that when we look about diversifying fuels. You don't have to have a plug-in hybrid that uses gasoline and diesel. It can use one of these more, um, you know, carbon-free fuels. So again, like I said, unlike other revenue for electric utilities, they are uh, like if you're if you are a biofuel and you are a refinery, um, and others know this on the panel, um, then that you if you are selling the biofuel, that that value of that credit goes to the the biofuel. Um, and then they can spend it to invest in their future production or however they want. That is not true of electricity credits. 
that go to utilities, the state can obligate those utilities in that to use that revenue to further other goals that it may have, like in California, uh, a move towards electrification. So I want to this slide and 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 Colin showed with a bunch of these, but I just I, I think this is particular interest particularly interesting because it makes the point that although we had this outcome and we had these scenarios and I forgot who showed some of the scenarios I think it was Alex um you know and there and and we always had these most likely scenarios which I I just I, I want to just caution us against that because I I will say that I've never seen a most likely scenario that actually happened and so I think it's it's important to look at scenarios as just scenarios and and there, I mean, like we ran a scenario on electric cars and how many charging infrastructure, how much charging infrastructure. There are 243 different iterations of those scenarios. I think that is how we should consider scenarios. And 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 what I would say, say is what happened with this, what I think of as an incredibly successful fuel policy, um, was that what we anticipated in the scenarios we put out there didn't didn't come to fruition. And in, in fact, uh, electricity generated way more credits than anybody ever thought, as did renewable diesel. So there were these two kind of surprise breakout fuels. And you can see from these, from the left side of this slide, that like if you look at just electricity, which is sort of my focus, because I am an elect electric vehicle advocate, um, the top golden bar on the left side is small, but on the right side is bigger. And that's because the carbon intensity value of electricity in California as we de as we work to decarbonize the electric sector is so is so low and so it generates per kilowatt hour more um, more carbon credit reduction than than other fuels and the same is true for some of the other renewable fuels so I'm focused on electricity but I want to make it very clear that we in and when I was in state government and in the private sector now, um, we support uh, all fuels that reduce car the carbon content and and believe that it's very important to have this d diverse portfolio because, as Ryan said, <laughs> the fuel that we want to diversify is is really oil. Um, we want to have we want to have our transportation sector be more diverse and rely on a more diverse portfolio of fuels, which will increase the resiliency of our economy and our um, environment. So I'm going to I'm just going to close out there and I do look forward to questions. And again, I just want to appreciate the fact that the Vermont <laughs> decided to invite a couple of Californians. I'm not really a native Californian, but I consider it my home. Um, to speak today, because I, I think that particularly on the academic side, uh, there's there's a lot that we have to offer. And and I know because I've worked with Colin for many years and and the UC system and the academia, they are very willing to help and and their contribution, it 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 supersedes politics, which I think is just important when you're looking at a field policy because you know, politics can get in the way of good policy, and that's, in my mind, why it's important to include academia as you develop these kinds of very um, complex but important and successful policies. So thank you again. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you for acknowledging um, Vermonters uh, anxieties towards uh, what California has to say, but but we certainly recognize um, that it's really important for us to draw on expertise from from wherever it comes. So uh, so thank you. I'm married to a Californian. So fantastic. So now we have we're going to Vermont. Um, I'd like to introduce Matt Coda. Um, Matt is um, the executive director of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, which is a nonprofit trade organization of energy retailers and service providers. Um, Matt also operates the Vermont Fuel Training Center, uh, which provides tech ed for the skilled trades, plumbers, burners, tank inspectors, and CDL operators. Um, so Matt really has his finger on the pulse of biofuels, as well as some of the workforce issues. Um, Matt's also a member of the South Burlington City Council. So Matt, go ahead and take it over. 
Great, thank you for that. And I appreciate uh, the the overview of what's happening in California, lessons that we could learn here in Vermont and, and glad to be uh, my friend Tom and our batting cleanup with the Vermonters talking about what's happening here on the ground. Uh, I happen to be one of those politicians. I was recently elected to the city council in South Burlington, our second largest city by population. But I'm also a policy advocate. And I'm also a small business advocate. Um, so let me give you an example uh, through a few slides about what's happening here in Vermont when it comes to distribution of petroleum. Uh, first of all, um, it is, as you've seen before, and as you surmise, it is how we uh, move cars and trucks around Vermont. 97% of the fuel sold uh, by our member companies uh, is either gasoline or diesel fuel. That's 97% of the transportation fuel. And on the heating side and the thermal sector, most homes rely on heating oil for heat and hot water. Um, and propane as well, which is a deliverable liquid fuel, although it used burned as a gas. Um, you know, a lot of these companies have been in business for a long time. I want to push back against my three friends from California, or, or Ryan in particular. Um, I don't know how it works in California. I can tell you in Vermont, there is no monopoly. Um, in Vermont, the companies that, that distribute liquid fuel for combustion engines, that distribute liquid fuel for heating, uh, for heating hot water or, or providing uh, heat for your boiler, your furnace. Um, they're small businesses. According to the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies, the average fuel company in Vermont has just 12 employees. But the name on the side of the truck is the person driving the truck, or it's the person in the front office answering the phone in the middle of the night. Um, I come from one of those families. My grandmother, Helen, my grandfather, Ken, started a kerosene company in 1941 in Bells Falls, Vermont. I'm a seventh generation Vermonter. I can tell you there are no monopolies here, but a bunch of hardworking Vermonters that are dedicated to keeping our rural economy moving. So I just want to state that. Some of them started out as coal and ice companies. Use the same truck, you distribute ice in the, in the summertime and coal in the winter. Uh, and then we all strung electric lines and got frigid airs. And we all started figuring out that it was a much cleaner way to heat your home through kerosene. Of course, those companies evolved. They don't own refineries, they don't own terminals, they don't own mines or wells. They distribute an energy product directly to the end consumer here in Vermont. And so they moved from coal and ice to kerosene, to heating oil, to low sulfur heating oil, to propane. So now the question is, you know, what comes next? Um, well, what comes next um, is, a, is a very good question. When it comes to distillate, uh, it's clear that the answer for us is biodiesel. As mentioned uh, so eloquently by the previous speakers, uh, there's real opportunities in Vermont when you consider that a third of our petroleum, liquid petroleum that we sell, uh, whether it's heating oil used in burners and furnaces and boilers for heat and hot water, whether it's clear diesel used for trucks, uh, heavy duty trucks or dye diesel, off-road diesel, um, used for trains in our farm economy. It really distillate is the fuel that powers our rural economy. And we sell 200 million gallons of it every year here in Vermont. And so there's real opportunities here um, to absolutely um, have that become the product that we sell um, as a blended product. You know, there are some people that say maybe it's back to biomass, back to the future. Indeed, uh, there are a number of traditional fuel companies. Some of them started out as coal companies that are distributing pellets and biomass. Many of these uh, uh, heating service companies are installing high efficiency equipment. Many of them are installing electric heat pumps um, uh, for air conditioning and for heating. But these measures alone, biomass, pellets, energy efficiency, weatherization, and cold climate heat pumps, those alone are not enough to move the needle in the amount of time we need to in order to comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act. In order to comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act, we need a drop in fuel, a drop in fuel that we can immediately show a reduction in carbon. And we have it. We have it with biomass based diesel fuel. The advantage of renewable liquid fuels, as stated earlier by our friends from California, we're utilizing the existing storage and distribution infrastructure. Those 110,000 eating oil tanks scattered throughout the homes and businesses throughout Vermont, uh, the trucks. Uh, the bulk plants, um, those can all work seamlessly with existing appliances, the, the fuel that goes in these tanks, with existing trucks and appliances, and deliver immediate reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, really at no additional cost to the consumer. 
So how do you get there? Well, you know, um, the North, this is not just a Vermont thing. It's not just a California thing. That throughout the Northeast, they're struggling with the same uh, concepts and ideas of how you get there. In Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York recently passed mandates. So all three of those states, which re represents about 40% of the heating oil volume uh, across the Northeast, um, these states will require uh, biodiesel or renewable diesel to be blended into the oil heat supply in ever increasing numbers. We could go that route. We currently have a biodiesel mandate passed in 2011. Um, however, it, it has a trigger mechanism in which it will only be adopted when substantially similar mandates take effect. The legislature in January of next year could remove that trigger and we could have a mandate immediately. It would be a simple fix in the legislation, uh, in the law. Or we could do a different approach, um, and that is a clean heat standard. Um, the clean heat standard um, is an idea that is really popping up in one of the subcommittees uh, for the Vermont Climate Council, which, as you may know, on December 1st, will deliver their action plan to how we're going to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals that were mentioned earlier. The clean heat standard is similar to what you have in California with, with the low carbon fuel standard for transportation, only this deals with heating. This allows the existing workforce, the existing competitive marketplace of businesses that provide heat uh, and heating services to show that they're reducing carbon emissions from their, their customers, whether they're installing cold climate heat pumps or selling a, a pellet stove or boiler or selling renewable liquid fuel uh, in the place of heating oil, a standard petroleum distillate, um, that they can obtain credits, credits that have to, would be, have to be purchased uh, by wholesale suppliers of fossil fuels in order to meet our carbon reduction goals. That is really what we're weighing, whether it's a mandate or whether it's a clean heat standard, like a low carbon fuel standard. What we don't think will work is what has been proposed, which is a ban. Banning an oil burner eliminates the possibility that you could have this renewable fuel supply. The other thing it does is it doesn't achieve the goals of the speed you which you need them. If we reduce emissions by 26% by 2025 or 40% by 2030, which is what is required in the Global Warming Solutions Act, the oil burners in the tanks that we're installing today will be using that fuel for another 30 to 40 years. Much better to use a drop in fuel that immediately reduces the carbon uh, content of our product rather than wait 30 years for that house to be renovated uh, and the, the heating system to be updated. So uh, we're very excited about the possibility of renewable distillate, of biodiesel, uh, the different potentials that we can use to transform uh, our rural economy, which depends on diesel fuel and heating oil for both, uh, for both our trains and our farm equipment, our skidders, our feller bunchers, our milk trucks, and our heating systems in nearly half the homes in Vermont. So that's why uh, this transition to renewable energy uh, particularly in the heating oil and the diesel sector, is uh, provides a great opportunity. I think for many of these businesses that have been providing the service for some for over 100 years. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, all right, we are kind of running over time, but we have uh, one more presenter, Tom Murray. Tom is the VP of Decarbonization Technology at Vermont Gas Systems. He oversees the company's efforts to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. He is leading the company's innovation initiatives, which include becoming the first gas utility in the nation to offer a renewable gas program, which started in 20, 2018, sorry, um, green hydrogen pilot projects and other decarbonization efforts. Uh, Tom also handles legislative community and key stakeholder relationships for Vermont Gas Systems. Okay, Tom, take it over. Then we'll right, get into great. question and answers. Can everybody see my the presentation in full view? Because I'm in the the presenter mode here. Is it okay? Cool. Yes. Thank you. I can see. Um, it. So uh, I'm going to move fairly quickly, folks. We're doing a lot of stuff at Vermont Gas VGS now uh, to advance the ball on climate. Uh, it's pretty exciting stuff, and it's kind of a, a, a nation leading stuff. So we. Um, we, for the folks that don't are familiar with Vermont Gas, we're the only uh, natural gas utility in uh, in Vermont, and uh, we serve kind of the northwest corner, which includes Burlington and, and kind of the large areas of the larger metro areas, if you if you want to call them that in Vermont. We have about fifty thousand customers, um, so we have a fair, a very aggressive climate plan. Basically, we want to be net zero by twenty fifty, and we want to be a thirty percent reduction by uh, twenty thirty. In fact, with the climate plan. 
that was re referred to earlier. If you add in the savings that we've had uh, over the years, conversions from oil and our efficiency programs, we're probably at closer to the 40 percent by, by 2030. So we're excited about that. And our and our plan to get there is, is increasing our energy efficiency program. We're, we, we're planning to double that. and We've got the authority to increase our spending dramatically there. Uh, RNG at 20 percent in our system. We're the first gas utility that had a retail RNG program. Most of what you heard about in, in California and other places has been driven by the vehicle market. Where our intent is to put RNG in our system to displace uh, thermal heating fuels and a little bit of vehicle fuels, but but for the most part, our, our goal is to reduce our, our thermal uh, carbon footprint. And we're doing a whole bunch of partnerships with uh, a whole variety of folks. Electrification, we're supporting electrification where it makes sense, and uh, uh, and other innovative partnerships, uh, district energy systems. Uh, a whole, a whole variety of pro, uh, programs. So this this pie chart is something I put together just to give people kind of an idea of what it could look like in the future. So increasing more RNG in our system, increasing more hydrogen in our system. Some of these pieces of the pies are actually reductions, so reducing uh, uh, consumption efficiency programs, you know, smart thermostats, elect electrification will be part of that. It, it, some of the load will shift over electrification where it makes sense. So this is kind of what it could look like. How could we be a, a, a net zero company? Um, the uh, uh, next slide here is just, you know, we, we're, we're talking about RNG a lot. Our program launched with out-of-state RNG, but we just basically uh, uh, we just last week launched our first in-state RNG project, a farm project, and and uh, probably subject of uh, uh, more discussion uh, later on today. But uh, you heard it quite a bit about this carbon intensity concept in the LCFS in California. I think there's an opportunity for um, uh, you know Vermont Gas to uh, uh, in the state, for that matter, to to drive more ag. Uh, RNG projects or biodiesel projects, whatever it's going to be, electric projects to maximize the the carbon benefit by by helping out farmers and capturing the methane that's going out of the atmosphere. So, um, the uh, just kind of kind of bank through some of my slides here. So th this this slide here basically is a, a slide prepared by the American Biogas. Uh, uh, association uh, as well as an AGA study that looks at the availability and basically we pr probably. Uh, uh, we probably can uh, replace you know, about 70, 80 percent of our, our system with um, uh, uh, RNG produced in Vermont, basically. I apologize, I'm getting a bunch of messages back and forth here that I'm trying to do this. So that's just to give you a potential. I do want to make um, a, a, a point. I, I talked about the carbon intensity. So this chart uh, talks about the, the carbon intensity of different types of renewable gas sources, and it, hopefully it's not too direct. But the bottom line that you see there is negative carbon intensity, meaning that it has enormous beneficial uh, carbon reduction potential. And really, when you look at the LCFS, a lot of the uh, the renewable gas, all the renewable gas that is in there is uh, is is uh, driven to a large extent by the ag sector. So, for example, in California, uh, a lot of the RNG in the last few years has come from Landfills and places like that. Well, you'll see landfill RNG is, has a has a more uh, detrimental carbon effect, better than natural gas, but less than uh, uh, farm gas. But what's going to happen in California over the coming years is almost all the RNG is probably going to come out of farm-based projects because of this really low scoring. So, we're, what does this mean for Vermont? Basically, you know, I would strongly encourage that that our LCFS or a our clean heat standard that that Matt referred to takes into account. A, a carbon intensity model, and I believe that's what they're proposing, uh, because that really helps us drive this uh, really to the, the 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 critical need, and that's addressing climate change. So if we can do farm projects, we can reduce our uh, our carbon footprint much faster. Um, this is really about cost effectiveness, and this is a chart that somebody else had prepared. I think Washington Gas and ICF prepared, but it's just it's looking at different solutions for addressing climate change needs. Obviously, energy efficiency tends to always be the one that's most most cost effective, um, and then it kind of goes up the scale. But RNG is in is in that is in that sweet spot. It's in yellow on the chart there. When you look at other, you know, beneficial electrification can be expensive because you you've got to weatherize. 
you've got to uh, replace uh, a lot of the heating equipment with uh, with cold climate heat pumps. So depending on the house, there's going to be candidates that are good candidates for electrification. There's going to be other candidates where we've got to find other solutions, basically, and that could be could be renewable gas. It could be biodiesel. It could be other solutions. Um, but we have to be open to looking at this in a way that is going to balance the environmental needs and, and the cost effectiveness so that we can do this in a way that's going to work for our economy. Um, this uh, this next slide, you saw my pie chart earlier. This is just another version of it in terms of what gas utilities are working on to kind of transition their systems. Um, you know, first of all, methane reductions throughout our system. Well, our system, frankly, is, is one of the more modern systems in the country. So we have we were always in the top like five gas gas utilities, I mean numerically five of the hundreds of gas utilities in the country because we just we have a no leak policy. So we don't leak a lot of methane in our system, but that's something uh, nationwide that gas utilities are very focused on. And then you go down this, the uh, the steps of energy efficiency, which you know uh, we are a like efficiency Vermont, we are energy efficiency utility in the thermal space. So we'll weatherize homes and, and, and what have you. And we have got all sorts of incentives to help people. Right now we spend about uh, I think it's about three and a half, four million dollars on efficiency each year. And then you go up the stack, renewable gas, we're already doing that. Uh, and uh, hydrogen, we're, we're right in the middle of several green hydrogen projects where we'll take uh, green hydrogen that's created from excess renewable electricity that was talked about earlier. We'll blend it in our gas system. And uh, for the most part, we're going to do that at large industrial customers in, in the early years. But as we go forward, we'll be doing that without our whole system and have a percentage of green hydrogen blended with the uh, the regular gas and the RNG. So that's kind of a, a pathway that's out there. I, you know, there's a lot of talk earlier in panels about you know, the other panelists about vehicle sector. You know, for our for from our system, you know, we're 99% focused on thermal application. So we uh, there is a role uh, like we see in California for renewable gas in the heavy duty sector. Um, and we've got a couple, a handful of customers that have uh, compressed natural gas vehicles that will be converting to RNG. Our fleet at, at VGS, we've got a handful of vehicles that are running on renewable natural gas. That is an opportunity to expand. Um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, as I said earlier, if we can adopt a system that has that feel of a, the low carbon fuel standard, uh, we can do a lot of renewable gas projects in Vermont. Uh, and even ones that are not on our system, we're looking at several projects where we would. Uh, uh, bring the gas from a remote area to our system, uh, probably by truck, because that's the most uh, cost effective way to do it. But that opens up the door to any cluster of farms. We're looking at clusters of farms because we have so many small farms. So that's kind of our model uh, as we sit here today is looking at the uh, clusters of farms that we can justify the investment. I put just kind of a laundry list of what's going uh, on around around the globe here. I say globe around around North America. There's a variety of states that are moving forward with uh, renewable gas standards. Looks and feels like a clean heat standard, but it's basically saying that gas utilities can purchase uh, uh, X amount of gas. We we talked about the low carbon fuel standard. We talked a little bit about the federal renewable fuel standard. So there's a whole stack of uh, different uh, things that are out there. I think the Climate Council. Uh, I suspect it's probably going to make a recommendation around a clean heat standard, as was alluded to earlier, and that will be the uh, the start of this pathway. So we're excited about that. Um, we're excited about the opportunity. If I, you know, for those of you that probably don't follow it that closely, uh, we've had the pleasure of being kind of at the uh, the the cutting edge of the renewable gas discussion uh, for the last seven years. And uh, candidly, there was crickets uh, seven years ago. And now you can't go to a meeting and not have people uh, focused on renewable gas. You know, a meetings that I would be one of 12 at five years ago now has 300 people that are signing up for it. And the same thing's going on with green hydrogen around the globe. Green hydrogen is seen as the the scalable large storage uh, tool that we need for all the renewable electricity that we're going to create. So we think our system can be a foundational piece of infrastructure for the clean energy future. And we're excited about uh, uh, meeting that challenge. So with that, I will uh, uh, step back and let the, the, uh, the thing continue here. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Um, and thanks for um, speeding things along. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so Alex Stipilis, maybe you can um, help me with uh, the Q&A. What we're going to do right now is we're um, invite folks um, to uh, ask questions of any of the presenters. 
Um, I will moderate the Teams chat. Um, so there's uh, the Teams chat, the one on the, the sidebar we can't access right now, um, but or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to go ahead and ask your questions. Right, thank you, Peggy. So <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we'll, and then- What we'll do one, here is, okay, go, ahead. go ahead. We will do is uh, take hands uh, in the order that I can figure out people have raised their hands and then anyone else that's coming in by phone, I'll, I'll try to uh, just you'll jump in after uh, hands. So I think we'll just do hands, phone, hands, phone. So after I take a hand, I'm going to ask if there's anybody uh, calling in that would just like to ask a question. So uh, go ahead. And uh, I'm not seeing any raised hands yet. Is that right? Maybe um, Peggy, could you check and see if raising your hand works? All right, Peggy says no one's called in. That's good to know. Uh, here's um, raising hand works. You can presumably see mine. I can see yours. Yes, so that's good. Raising hand works. Here's Jim Muir. Uh, go ahead, Jim Muir. Check, check. Jim Muir, Agricultural Digesters. You might have the audience uh, muted. Uh, so he, okay, now I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I think I'm okay, muted. Can, 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 can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Go Good. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Alex. Uh, you know my situation pretty well. I've I've been up here uh, visiting Vermont for about four years, and with agricultural digesters, we're working at especially on clusters of medium uh, medium sized farms, and the we'd be all set. There are farmers ready to go. Um, the only holdback we have is um, with uh, NRCS, uh, much lesser degree USDA, uh, NRCS um, prioritizing uh, water quality in Lake Champlain, and also having a lot of uh, and having a lot of other farmers. I think they want a system, <laughs> and also a lot of other other requirements. Um, and I'm just wondering with the new Biden administration and the push for uh, methane elimination, is um, is the word going to go to uh, NRCS Vermont and so on to maybe step out of the usual patterns and do whatever they can to get these projects approved and especially grant money like EQIP approved? Um, I guess I'm going to take that because, uh, and others who may want of, of our speakers, it's not really something that a speaker's addressed, but yeah, NRCS is super intent on water quality. We have a huge issue. Everybody's kind of pulling on that rope to, to improve water quality in Vermont. And my sense is that the money will come from elsewhere, that it will, you know, be a thing. I just, Peggy just sent me a, a budget uh, item 20 million or 50 million or 100 million whatever it is uh that's a new budget item in the energy efficiency and renewable energy budget of the us doe so i think uh nrcs will um stay in their lane with water quality and we'll see that money come from elsewhere um and that's my my reading of the tea leaves anybody want to add anything to that the um we, we we have farms ready to go, and we're just waiting to find out about uh, grants and or allotments that are due. As long as we have an idea when the date will be, we can move ahead on permitting and things like that. Understood. Yep. Understood. And and just I'll, I'll just add to that, Alex. It's certainly to Jim's point. I mean, I think you know my my goal is to be able to create the business case or the 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 uh, demand, if you will, for the renewable gas at a fair market price, which. There's a lot of dynamics to that statement because of these different uh, marketplaces. But nonetheless, uh, but the additional cost for all the water quality remediation stuff that Jim is referring to, that is a perfect setup for uh, government to help out. So there's no reason why we should do one of these projects. I don't think you could do one of these projects without having to deal with phosphorus in Vermont, you know, a farm RNG digester or any digester for that matter. And uh, so that that's the opportunity. And with the current clean water funding that's out there and the additional stimulus that's going to be coming down the, the pipe here, pike here, uh, we're going to have a, a great chance to do more of these projects. So it's a pretty exciting time, actually. 
if I could just follow up just quickly on that, Tom. Um, actually, we do have a, a water quality uh, solution that has been uh, tentatively approved by NRCS, which is great. Uh, again, the, the idea is just getting an idea of when uh, allocations might come. And Tom, uh, I got to come talk to you. So uh, set up an appointment with me, please. <laughs> All right, a little lobbying there. Um, I think Ryan has his hand raised. Is that right? Oh, no. Jer well, first, Jared. Go ahead, Jared, please. Are you raising your hand? Uh, I I am, Alex, but if Ryan was first in line, I don't want to I don't want to cut. So I, I don't know. Let's take you first and then or Ryan. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Jared. And then Ryan's going to come in after you, I guess. Go ahead. OK, so I, I have a broad question, I think. Well, first, I just want to say thank you for organizing this. This has been incredibly um, well presented, informative, um, great addition to a lot of the deliberations happening across the state, including the Climate Council and more. And this question and any comments I make, I'll, I'll just clarify, is mostly coming in my role as a um, member of the climate, the Vermont Climate Council, not speaking on behalf of EAN or EAN members. Um, <clears throat> my question is for the speakers um, from California, Colin and Eileen. Um, and just for context, I'll sh basically um, repeat a comment I made yesterday at the Climate Council, which is, you know, if we think about our goals as a state, and I think many states think about their goals this way, um, as being to reduce greenhouse gas pollution, to reduce energy costs and strengthen our economy, economy equitably and cost effectively, it's clear to me that some of the mechanisms that are being talked about in Vermont, how we ensure that that happens in certain sectors. I think that there's a clear mechanism and driver to achieve those things through the design of the renewable energy standard for the electricity sector and a little bit beyond it when we talk about the, the tier three of the renewable energy standard. Uh, people will have different opinions about how that gets designed, but it's a clear policy mechanism to provide regulatory clarity, market clarity, and, and make sure that um, goals are achieved. Similarly, I think that is true um, in the heating sector with the possible design of the clean heat standard that has been proposed and is getting attention in the Climate Council. What is less clear to me is there is uh, there are a lot of programs and uh, possibilities being talked about in the transportation sector, um, yet many of them are, are more uh, around incentives or funding, but it does not yet seem to have an overarching kind of regulatory or policy framework that it would ensure it happens similar to what has happened in California with the low carbon fuel standard. And so that's a long introduction to my question, which is, can you shed some light on how California has handled um, this challenge of both trying to work sector by sector? I know you've got a, um, a, a total energy approach or economy-wide emissions reduction approach through your participation in the Western Climate Initiative. You've also got a low carbon fuel standard focused on transportation. You've also got uh, an, uh, an RPS or it's a renewable portfolio standard or it's equivalent on the electricity sector. Can you speak a little bit to how those um, get those different policy and regulatory frameworks get harmonized and aligned so that um, the, the, they work effectively in, in a complementary way with each other rather than duplicating efforts? And if you have any thoughts on um, suggestions for Vermont on the transportation side, um, it was interesting to hear Matt um, and others talk about, you know, the low carbon fuel standard as a possibility. I'm, I'm wondering if there is advice there as well. I'll, so I'll I, add a friendly amendment. What shouldn't we do? <laughs> um, so I, I can take that. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's a lot of elements to this. It's a large portfolio. Um, one of the things to realize with, with California is this has been really an almost 20 year effort at this point. Uh, you know, California, we passed AB 32, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, in 2006, but there had been a number of really significant climate change bills uh, and regulatory efforts that had um, started then. The first, uh, you know, sort of beginnings of the zero emission vehicle mandate and, and the effort to require that actually started in the late 1990s. So, um, 
you know, uh, I, I guess my first advice would be invent a time machine, uh, go back and, and try to give ourselves the opportunity to do it on a really, you know, slow, gradual uh, pace. But um, I think from a, a structural and regulatory standpoint, the, the key uh, process in California is what we call the scoping plan. Uh, and that is sort of a master climate strategy document that the Air Resources Board, uh, which is the, the regulatory agency given primary jurisdiction over climate policy, uh, updates about every five years. And that sort of looks at the, the total uh, large economy-wide targets for California um, and the existing policies and assesses you know, what is needed to, to hit these ambitious long-term targets um, and develops a master strategy. And the scoping plan, you know, it, it's, we're, we're just starting the process to, to do the most recent scoping plan update. The last one was in 2017. Um, it's going to be about a year of workshops and discussions and negotiations. Uh, there's the the study that I, I showed the slide from earlier uh, done by the UCITSs. Um, that's going to feed into a lot of the analysis on, on the transportation side. And we started working on that last year. Um, you know, so the, the, the answer is you, you need to have this sort of master climate strategy that looks at it at a high level, focuses on, on targets and focuses on sort of in broad strokes, what needs to happen. Uh, and then once the scoping plan process gets done in California, the, the various regulatory agencies that have control over some part of the climate policy, which is basically to say all of them, because it really touches, touches every part of the economy, they will then take this broad strategic instruction from the scoping plan and adopt new rules or amend existing rules in order to, to do that. Um, but basically, it's this regular process of reviewing the sum total of existing uh, targets, the sum total of existing policies, figuring out how close you, you get, and then um, sketching out some portfolio that will, will ultimately get the state from point A to, to point B um, through a, an exhaustive, you know, very strongly science-based, but with a lot of public engagement and a lot of consideration of things like equity, environmental justice, uh, you know, economic and, and workforce impacts, et cetera. Um, I, I, you know, I recognize that that may not be quite as helpful an answer because it's basically just a lot of work and a lot of resources, but that's, that's what it takes. Um, I do think that there's an opportunity to, uh, use some of the structures that you mentioned, things like the Western Climate Initiative or broad economy-wide carbon pricing programs. Um, I, I think there's, there's the, the general approach in California is we have a few sectors that are primary targets, transportation being one, electricity being one, and um, we have specific policies aimed at, at those targets uh, for really the, the major emitters. And then we have some kind of broader uh, market-based or economic incentive-based programs that catch everything else. And that's really the function of the, the cap and trade system in, in California. I think that model ends up working pretty well where you identify the most clear areas of need, focus policies on those, and then have a carbon price or, or uh, you know, the, the carbon price plus the LCFS plus a few other market-based policies uh, that, that help push everything else along as well and also help make the economics of the projects in the critical areas a lot more attractive. Um, the last thing I, I would say, uh, and this is something that I think California is going to have to start addressing because it hasn't really integrated into its, its policies so far. Uh, I, I think there needs to be more consideration of um, what technologies or what policies are uh, capable of actually achieving the kind of deep decarbonization we need by, by mid-century. You know, the IPCC says that uh, industrialized economies like the U.S. have to be basically carbon neutral, you know, by 2050, 2055, somewhere in there. Um, and so I think uh, when we think about the, the technology and policy options, we need to start really asking our questions for every one. Does this technology have the ability to contribute to that carbon neutral portfolio in 30 years? Even if the answer is no, that doesn't mean you, you, you ban it or you ignore it or even that, that you completely avoid incentivizing it because there is absolutely a role for technologies that can get you part of the way there now can, you know, sort of reduce emissions by time and, and mitigate some of the harm of climate change in the interim. Uh, but I do think you need to treat the, the policies that don't necessarily have that pathway to long-term uh, uh, carbon neutrality in a different way than you do the ones that, that can at least move you in the right direction, but can't get you all the way to your, your final goal. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think you guys need to connect.
offline. That was fascinating. We're going to have time for one more question after Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, I think it it, it works well with the, these previous comments. I, I simply wrote in my notes during the presentations, and again, thank you to Colleen, uh, to Eileen and, and Colin on on presenting the California story. It seemed to me as they were presenting it that it might feel overwhelming, that there's a lot of details in the policy. And I simply wanted to point out that as I traveled across the country over the last decade to share the this, this similar story, I was often sharing the Oregon story because they simply crossed out low carbon fuel standard, put in clean fuels program and uh, replicated the California program. And California wants other states to do that. They are encouraging that. They've done all the work. They've spent their 15, you know, hundred person staff over, you know, tens of thousands of hours to to finalize these these types of programs that now Oregon and now Washington are literally taking off the shelf, doing very small tweaks. They have one and a half staff uh, initially now, now maybe two and a half staff in Oregon to do this program. This is the kind of um, kind of smarts that I really would encourage other states like Vermont to follow, where we can say, let what are the best lessons learned from these other programs and take it off the shelf. It does not have to be overwhelming. And we don't have to just look out to the West Coast. There are other states that have struggled for many years, implemented things like Minnesota, another northern state has has done a B20 mandate. So for seven months out of the year, they're using 20% uh, biodiesel. And, and are excellent, uh, um, you know, implementing that, helping their rural economy do that. Illinois has, has similar incentive. Iowa has other incentives. So there's a lot of great opportunities, and we don't have to um, be bogged down necessarily by the regulatory complexity, but I'm so grateful for Colin uh, and all the work that he's done, um, but we can learn from and grow from there. So that would be my my point. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, just. You know, we need to move on, but a quick opportunity here, Tom or Matt or Eileen, any reactions to that? I mean, this is sort of like the big question, right? What could the policy be? And we just heard a very interesting perspective there um, from the other two. But Tom or Matt or Eileen, any reflections on that? Well, the, the comment about what we shouldn't be doing, I mean, I think in, in our our colleagues from California made it very clear um, is that it's an all-in approach. It's not just electrification. Uh, it's not just biomass. It's not just biofuel. Um, and uh, and and we have you know heard talks about bans. Um, talked about in Burlington. They're talking about in South Burlington. Talking about in other communities. And I think ban. There's a visceral reaction to a ban, but you are in effect uh, limiting your opportunities. Uh, to reduce carbon when you ban equipment that can utilize renewable fuel. So that's what I'm advocating for, is for not bans and for other opportunities. Tom? And I, and I agree, agree with Matt and that kind of, but you know, I think, I think we're a good example of a company that's already responding to this market change. It's not, we don't need to have the mandates per se. I mean, the mandates will be helpful as we get more and more percentages and things like that. Um, and certainly to the comments that were made earlier, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the LCFS because I see I've seen what it's done in the renewable gas space. Um, but with, there's balancing act there in terms of how you do it. And there's a lot of complexity there. But I, I would say, yeah, we should we should spend quite a bit of time, uh, you know, uh, cribbing from where California and Oregon are and what have you. So in that regard. And uh, yeah, I mean. Our infrastructure is just a pipe and we're an infrastructure company. We're not a fossil fuel company. And we think we can transition our infrastructure to clean energy. And if we can't, the the standard should be that we don't, you know, we're, we're out of business in, in 30, 40 years. But the reality is, is uh, we can deliver clean energy. We're doing it today. And we think we can just grow that over the years to come and, uh, and, and, and move forward on this whole challenge for climate change. That's what we're doing at Vermont Gas VGS. Eileen, go ahead briefly, please. I think this is this will wrap it up here um, after this little after your response. I would just say that the importance of academia as you pursue your goals in Vermont is going to be critical. And I'm glad Colin's here to help you. We would also help in, in any way we can. I just 
I just think that what Colin said was there, you have your plan and it sounds like Vermont already has a strategic plan to get to carbon neutrality. You treat those fuels or those policies that don't get you to where you want to go perhaps a little differently than those that do. And, and to the question of bans, I don't think California has a 100% zero emission target. Um, and, and I think you can have those kinds of targets that, that aren't necessarily bans and also include programs according, like, like Colin said, include policies that, that get you there over time and then and start phasing out policies that don't. And I just wanna say one thing, and that is regulations are really important, but so are incentives. So somebody brought up incentives and the importance of incentives. I'm just gonna say that you gotta have the suite and the plan, and it sounds like Vermont's already on that path. So. Thank you. Thanks. So now, remember everybody when I said you decide, well, we've lost a few people, so they don't get to decide. And um, they're gonna be not in the breakout rooms, which we are now gonna have. So um, our uh, esteemed uh, panelists and organizers here will moderate some breakout rooms. Uh, Peggy, over to you, please, on uh, how we're gonna do these breakout rooms. And by the way, like I said, we're gonna capture what happens in these rooms and that's going to be part of the takeaway for this whole thing. So thank you. Go ahead, please, Peggy. Great, thank you. So uh, we're going to randomly assign folks to breakout rooms. Um, you know, you'll have about 10 minutes to come up with a policy. Um, this is really just to start generating ideas. Then we're going to come back for just a kind of a rapid fire. What are what are some of the issues uh, that came to the surface? So Jessica, can you enable the breakout rooms? Okay, it's just going to take a second to pop up. Oh my God, we're losing people. Come on, people. Jessica's behind the curtain, moving those levers. I know the gerbils and the UVM computers are just, they're a little tired today, and it's literally populating one breakout room at a time, hang tight. Well, I could sing the national anthem. Or how about the Vermont state song? There you go. Oh, what? By the way, yep. while I'm thinking of, uh, So, you, you know what I'm going to do, Alex? I think what's happening is because we were randomly. Um, we were randomly assigning folks. Um, what happened is that the breakout rooms then were populating people who weren't here. Um, I say, Alex, let's try to moderate a conversation. We've got 15 attendees. Yep. Um, I think it's just gonna be more expeditious to do that. Yep. So we have, we have four general topics. Um, we can kind of go off beyond that. Um, Jessica, can you forward to the next slide so we can uh, just look at the, the topics? Um, one was jobs and workforce, thinking how um, the kind of how this fits into that, the cost of GHG saved in an implementation timeline, uh, regionalization, and then um, resilience. Patrick Wood, do you have a question? Would you like to? You want to start us off? Sure. Can people hear me? Yep. Go yep. ahead. Thanks. So I just, um, yeah, I thought I'd try and raise my hand quickly. Wasn't sure where this conversation would start. And really just want to say thank you, everybody, for a really excellent presentation that I think is really applicable to Vermont. 
My company, Ag Methane Advisors, helps dairies that produce biogas across the country create low carbon fuel standard credits. So these California policies that I'm, I'm sitting in Montpelier right now, but these California policies people are talking about, I've been working in and out of for more than 10 years. And I think they are really, really applicable. And I would echo Ryan's point that California um, wants these to be replicated. California specifically engages in climate diplomacy to develop these programs. And so I heard the head of Oregon's Clean Fuel Standard program say, ours is 98% developed by California. We just made a few tweaks to it. I think a couple of really great tweaks um, would be extending it to um, if there was a whatever you want to call it, low carbon fuel standard, clean fuel standard, having it be a um, thermal related clean heat program. Um, I also think it'd be really great to have it uh, be regional because Vermont alone is tiny. California is one of the sixth largest or sixth, seventh, eighth largest economy in the world. So having it be regional would be excellent. My big concern um, that could happen through the Transportation Climate Initiative, I have concerns about how ambitious that program is going to be. Um, I know there's talk of a clean fuel standard in New York. Um, it's maybe a, it's, it's not implemented yet, uh, but it's early on. And so whether it happens through TCI um, or in other ways, um, I think we need an ambitious program I think a clean fuel standard with thermal components is a great way to start, and um, and I think it should be should be regional. So I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and you folks, you can unmute. You can um, turn on your cameras now if you're interested, so we can see your beautiful faces. Go ahead. Um, so I uh, wanted to quickly talk about the idea of using the LCFS model for a sort of broader thermal program. Canada actually uh, investigated that. So Canada is in the process of developing a clean fuel standard, um, which is conceptually very similar to uh, the, the low carbon fuel standard. Their first draft was actually to include pretty much all fuels, including heating, uh, heating fuels, stationary source fuels, things like that. Um, the that really explodes the, the complexity of what is already an, uh, an already complex program, um, particularly because uh, one of the, the goals of a low carbon fuel standard is to get users to switch, um, you know, switch technologies or, or classes of, of fuels entirely, you know, in, in the transportation space to switch from internal combustion engines to electricity. When you start doing that math on stationary applications, it it becomes, it, depending on what your existing fleet looks like and, and what fuels are being used in significant quantities, um, you can end up developing a market where it's really hard to achieve a stable credit balance uh, and, and to keep the, the credit price and, and the incentive stable. Um, it's certainly possible to have kind of a, a stationary only uh, LCFS um, in addition to a transportation only LCFS um, trying to put them all into the same pool uh, introduces a whole lot of, of complexity, and um, I'm, I'm, I would be cautious about advocating for that until you've had the chance to really model the entire transportation sort of sector in the, the area that you're, you're talking about, whether it's Vermont or, or a regional uh, you know, collection of, of states or jurisdictions. Um, as for the, the, the regional action, uh, definitely, you know, the, the, in general, the larger your geographic area is that your carbon policy covers, the less chance there is for leakage, the less chance there is for, uh, you know, sort of fuel shuffling. Um, so, you know, at some point we need to get everyone uh, that from, you know, everyone in the country and ideally really everyone in the world to adopt um, a strong climate policy. Uh, and if the the pathway to that is to have more regional uh, collaborations, then, then absolutely. And, and I would just suggest that um, that you know California is getting a lot of attention here, and we we do we are a, a, a nation state in part because we're just so large, but the entire world <laughs> is endeavoring to reduce carbon content of fuels, and in fact, setting goals that increase the number of zero emission cars and trucks. And so, you know, I, I think that although California does have a fuel policy that I think has probably been, you know, 
one of the most successful in the world. Um, I, I know that in my work, we often look to other countries and other places because unlike before where it felt like you know, certain countries or certain nation or certain states or subnationals were islands. Right now, the whole world is is really, uh, including places like China that may not be as developed, India, are really looking at at a low carbon, zero carbon future and and very concerned about the impacts of climate change. So we're kind of working together as a global community. I don't think, and and I think there are a lot of policies that Vermont and California and other states can adopt um, that the rest of the world has already implemented. So I, I do want to just point out that we're not we're not alone. None of us are. Um, we're in a global community that's very concerned about climate change. And much like Vermont, California is very susceptible to some of the adverse consequences. So it, you know, this is it, it's worth as you work on these policies, policies really considering what worked and what didn't work nationally and internationally. I can add uh, a few just pieces of commentary as well in that, you know, when it comes to these different sectors, um, I generally think of biofuels as kind of three major pillars today. So uh, within the renewable natural gas uh, and, and biogas arena, let's keep in mind that, you know, Vilsec wants to build one of these a week and yet, you know, Germany's built something like 9,000 agricultural digesters. We have something like 250 in the entire U.S. So um, Vermont is is 80 percent based around it, its dairy, uh, whether it's cheese or um, you know other process, even the corn and the the grains that it grows. It's a, it's based around dairy. So we should be taking a, a good advantage of this and trying to keep on track and. Um, we, we built our first one, as Tom mentioned, you know, uh, it was turned on last week, but before that it had been about seven years since we flipped the switch on one of these. Um, and we have about 15 in the state. So we have a long way to go and a lot of great opportunities here locally. Um, I also want, want to just emphasize again that there are great policies out there where we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, I, I think something like TCI that was mentioned is is kind of trying in, a, in an effort to uh, replicate off of uh, other programs, but it's doing its own flavor. And if everyone chooses a flavor of the month, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to get on apples to apples, similar platforms. And so um, picking programs like Oregon has, I think, shown the leadership of picking the California program, which let Washington follow suit, um, we should be replicating uh, good programs. And and the only reason to mention, to talk about the, the thermal piece, you know, it's a huge piece for uh, the Northeast. It just hasn't historically been a huge piece of the, the West Coast. Um, but we have this, uh, you know, we're, we're facing down real heat. And, you know, it, it mentioned in today's paper, that the, the fire season has extended by over 100 days since I was born. Um, so we're going to be cooling here in Vermont very soon. So we have a, a long way to go, but we have these great policies that we can replicate. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, um, uh, Ryan's only 35 years old. So, you know, things have been moving. All right. Uh, <laughs> We don't have a lot of time left. Uh, Peggy, you know, is there something sort of burning here in your mind that we need to uh, really talk about? Uh, maybe some of these, I don't know, trade-off issues. Um, I'd also, just looking at who's in, in the meeting still, um, you know, I have some colleagues here that are in the meeting. I, I know Jane Lazorczyk is uh, here. Um, she's the liaison for the Climate Council. Is there anyone else that's sort of involved in the policy making in Vermont? that uh, would like to kind of weigh in um, people on the Climate Council and so forth. Um, you know, that's one thing that's sort of in play here in the big policy arena. And I, I would also add, Alex, yeah. what, what, does, what can we offer the Climate Council? Like, what more information do you need, um, you know, from the folks on, on this call, um, the panelists? I mean, you know, we're resources for you as well as we move forward on this policy. So reach out to us, please. Let us know how 
Okay. Um, onward. Other other questions, concerns, burning desires. Uh, anybody? Go ahead, Carl. Carl Bear. There you go. There he is. Unmute. I apologize. Yes. I'm on Rygate Energy Committee on the Connecticut side of the state. And uh, one of the things that I've been uh, wondering about, and this would be, be a question for Matt, but he's not here, but maybe for the VGS guy if he's here. Um, these small, uh, the small businesses, the fuel businesses, to what extent? being um, worked on in terms of their, their workforce, certainly their employees uh, whose job skills need to continue to develop as the economy changes around biofuels. And the, the small businesses that are responsible for making these changes, I mean, Matt made a big, a big point about how many small businesses we have for providing the delivery. And so the, the, really the question is to what extent are they being helped, led, encouraged to move ahead with these plans for uh, biodiesel that uh, people seem to think are so important. And uh, on the other side of that question is on our side of the state, uh, Superior has bought up uh, the small propane dealers on our side of the state. And so it happens as there's more of a, uh, a corporatization or large business purchase of these small companies, um, you know, how is that going to impact the ability to kind of line up these uh, businesses to uh, make the changes that are seen as so important in, in this webinar. So those are the kind of issues that I have for both the employees and the small businesses. How do they get lined up to participate in this change that you're talking about? Thank you. Carl, that's, those are great questions. If I could address the, the last question first. Um, you know, I've been doing this job for 15 years and it never ceases to amaze me how many uh, individuals want to get into this business. So every time we do see a, a company come in and purchase another company, um, and I, I, I pay my mortgage on, on dues, so I can tell you quite clearly, a new company pops up, a company that was previously doing uh, heavy earth construction or a previous company that was a heating oil and now it's propane. So we see a tremendous uh, interest in this job because it is fundamental, right? We sell a product that no one really wants, but everyone needs, and it's a way that they can heat their home. So, um, so I, I, while we see uh, changes all the time in the company makeups, we see new entries as well. And some of those new entries will absolutely be focused on renewable fuels. And some of the traditional heating oil companies, as they diversify, will be will be uh, will be focused on both installing heat pumps, which they are today. Uh, selling biodiesel, which they are today, um, and in selling biomass pellets. And it's the same set of core skills we need in our skilled labor force, which is you need someone who can work with hydronics, so you need a plumber, you need someone who can work with fire, a burner, whether it's gas or oil or, or biomass or biodiesel, it's the same skill set. And of course, you need someone who can have a commercial driver's license that can drive a truck. All those are in high demand, well-paying jobs, local jobs. Um, so whether we're selling uh, biomass, biodiesel, um, it, it, it'll largely be the same workforce. The training that's involved to, uh, is, is significant. It's, uh, I don't want to underplay that, um, but it's something that we focused on our organization and our training uh, to ensure that the, the truck drivers, the uh, tank inspectors, that the, um, the oil uh, technicians, the plumbers understand that this is the way our energy future is going. It's going to a decarbonized heating fuel and these are the opportunities that individual companies have to uh, operate in that field. And some of them, you know, will choose to diversify. They'll choose to, uh, just like the dairy farmer, doesn't just sell milk anymore. He has a sugaring operation, a farm stand. The same thing's happening with the small businesses that provide heat and hot water to Vermonters. Uh, they're diversifying into air conditioning, heat pumps, biomass, plumbing, uh, emergency uh, response, uh, other home, whole home services. Um, so I think that's where our industry is going, because at the end of the day, you need someone in a truck that can drive to your house and fix what's broken. Carl, you're muted. If you're trying to speak, you're muted. 
I didn't realize, Matt, that you were on 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 questions. I'm glad you were there. Um, now, the way you talk about it, though, it sounds to me almost like a natural marketing process where this all happens. And I, I was more interested in in the, how the Fuel Dealers Association or other or, organizations like um, I mean, the college system, the community college system, uh, was thinking about how well, what role leadership has in getting these smaller businesses that, like, like you said, have been in business for years to make this move. You present it as kind of a move that anybody smart just going to do it. Uh, but I'm wondering, is that the extent of how you see the change taking place? Or can there be some on this to make it happen no, I, that's, a, that's a great point, Carl. And, and quite frankly, it's going to take a clean heat standard. There are a number of companies that sell biomass and biodiesel because they're cut, they see a marketing opportunity. Their customers want a cleaner fuel, and so they want to provide that. But they receive no credit when it comes to carbon reductions, and they see, receive no monetary value for doing such. Um, so for them, it, it is something that they believe in. It's something that they think their customers want, and they want to provide that service, a lower carbon fuel. But there is no regulation or monetary value associated with that reduction of carbon. A clean heat standard, while I agree with my colleague from California, it is complicated when you do a state by state approach, a regional approach would be much better. It does provide a base level for this un largely unregulated industry uh, to be able to, uh, you know, a company like Borns, uh, who has been selling bio heat, biodiesel and pellets for over 15 years, uh, now can now as an early innovator can now receive credit under that system. And what will happen is other companies will see the value in selling a lower carbon fuel, and then they'll copy. It. I mean, we're a mimic industry. I mean, if someone does something right and does it well in any business, you copy the leaders. And we, we have leaders right now that are that are really making a concentrated effort to reduce carbon. If this is now becomes there's a value associated with obtaining credits and re showing a carbon reduction to your customers, other other industry other uh, companies will follow the leader. Matt, are you convinced that um, there are enough people coming up at the pipeline and, and age back programs through the colleges and the vocational programs at the high schools? Do you think there are enough people being trained? I have a sense from our side of the state that we have a um, we we're not getting we're not getting the, uh, the amount of service people that are needed. You are a hundred percent correct. As someone who again I train truck drivers and heating technicians. We need more people, but it's it's everywhere, right? It's also the restaurant industry. Uh, Vermont needs more skilled laborers, and there are great opportunities. If you try to hire a plumber lately, or someone to install a heat pump or an oil burner, I mean, there the are tremendous wait times because there's just a lack of skilled. There's a lack of people, and perhaps there's a lack of interest. And we need to change that dynamic. Um, perhaps young people think that that our industry is not going to be around in 10 years, so they don't see a value in it. Uh, I'm here to make the case that we are going to be here. These small businesses that have been around for 100 years will be around for another 100, and they'll be selling a renewable liquid fuel and servicing renewable liquid fuel heating equipment. And that's my mission. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Carl, for those great questions. Um, sorry, getting some feedback here. Clearly, you know, jobs and workforce were at the top of my list here um, because we need to move forward on this as well. Uh, but we're, we're we're past time, and I really am so grateful for our panelists, um, Matt, Eileen, Colin, Tom, Ryan, uh, and Alex. Thank you very much for agreeing to um, put on this webinar. Um, thank you for all our participants, especially those who have kind of labored on. Um, it's past lunchtime. Uh, we will be sharing um, the slide deck as well as a recording with all uh, all those who registered. So again, thank you for your time. Alex, anything else? And also thank you to Jessica, who was behind the scenes this whole time, making sure everything was moving as smoothly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will compile a, a little bit of a summary and some takeaways here too. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Really appreciate your involvement. Thanks.